Hi there. So we'll just start with a little prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Um, and Almighty God, please bless our time here tonight. Please bless everybody's families, and please help us come closer to Jesus Christ, whose topic it is tonight. We ask this through Christ our Lord, um, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, so I'm just going to start out with a uh, scripture passage right off the bat. I put this one up there. Because uh, this passage for tonight to reflect on is uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan. This is a scripture passage that's right before the Good Samaritan parable. And uh, it's uh, the main gist of everything Jesus taught. So uh, you guys ever uh, take a literature class in high school and then never read the books? Uh, I did that. I either watched the movie or, I don't know if they still sell them, but got the Cliff Notes. This is basically the Cliff Notes version of the entire teaching of Jesus, and it's easy to remember. I like it because it's also easy to teach kids. And then uh, we're also just called to go ahead and uh, live that out so, the, so kids can see us if we're living out that passing but love, passage, loving the Lord of God with all of our heart, mind, and soul, loving our neighbor as ourself, then the Samaritan asks, they're not the Samaritan, but the uh, scribe asks, well, who is my neighbor? So then Jesus gives an example of a Samaritan who did not get along with Jewish people in general, like people in Jerusalem, people north of Jerusalem and Samaria, they did not get along. And uh, so Jesus is saying that this particular person who would be an enemy is your neighbor. So I'll just go ahead and read this real quick. It said, uh, but because he wished to justice, justify himself, he said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man fell victim to robbers as he went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. They stripped and beat him and went off, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road, but when he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. Likewise, Levi came to the place. When he saw him, he passed by on the opposite side. But a Samaritan traveler who came upon him was moved with compassion at the sight. He approached the victim, poured oil and wine over his wounds, and banished them. Then he lifted him up on his own animal, took him into an inn, and cared for him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper with the instruction take care of him. If you spend more than what I have given you, I shall repay you on my way back. Which of these three, in your opinion, was neighbor to the robber's victim? He answered, the one who treated him with mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. So the word mercy means love and compassion. So I like uh, at the beginning of CCD this year. I'll come back to this scripture passage later on uh, there. This one, Good Samaritan, is just kind of a little reflection on what that looked like since it's what, right after what Jesus said that. Um, when we started CCD with the older kids, the 6th to the 10th grade, at both churches, I talked to the kids, maybe not to, but with the kids, for 15 minutes. All of them for the first 15 minutes I'd go rotate each church for that and the first time I went there, there this year for both of them I asked them what is the purpose of going to CCD to get them teenage years frankly you don't want to be there and you fight it and uh, you don't know why you're there or what the purpose of it is and the basic purpose of having CCD really for all the ages is one reason. It's the topic tonight. Growing in a relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the only reason why we're here. And uh, so to grow in that relationship, I would kind of talk about why we need Jesus in our life and what Jesus did. The fact that we teach, that's to help our relationship with uh, Jesus. So I could pass along all the information you want, but the goal of the knowledge about Christ that he revealed to us, the goal is for us 
to serve him, have a personal relationship with him, and uh, worship him on the weekend at uh, Mass, the way he kind of set it up. So we, so we, and the kids today, when they talk about Jesus, they're going to talk about where do you encounter Jesus? We encounter Jesus through the scripture, through our prayer life, through receiving the Eucharist at church, through the sacraments, and also in uh, serving others, like Jesus said. If you do one of these things that he talked about, Matthew 25, when he talked about uh, feeding the hungry, giving shelter to those who don't, who are homeless, giving water to the thirsty, visiting the sick, visiting those in prison. He said, if you do this, you do it for me. So we're serving Christ in the person that we serve when we go ahead and uh, do that. So getting back to uh, Jesus, I kind of want to talk about the scripture foundation for what Jesus did during his ministry. I mentioned a little bit about it during uh, this weekend at church, and I want to talk a little bit about uh, God choosing a people. So God chose his people in Israel starting with Abraham. Abraham lived in about 1800 BC. He told Abraham that you will have as many descendants as the sands of the sea, and through your descendants, the world will be blessed. So then Abraham had Isaac, Isaac had Jacob, Jacob had 12 sons, and those 12 sons become, became the 12 tribes of Israel. Who, what, who, and then when Abraham is told that through his descendants, the world will be blessed, who's the descendant finally? Jesus. And uh, so with the 12, that's, the, that's a covenant God made with Abraham that through his descendants will bless the world. So it's, to me, it's extremely unique that God chose a particular people at a particular time to reveal himself to, and then over time, he revealed himself to his chosen people more. And then later on, in 1200 B.C., uh, God wanted to free his chosen people who are in Egypt from slavery, and he does that through Moses. God works through Moses, he parts the Red Sea, they get to the mount, and what do, does God reveal to Moses? The two tablets, the Ten Commandments. And the thing I think is interesting about the Ten Commandments is God gave them to the cho his chosen people 1200 B.C., and they still hold up today. And when he gave them to his chosen people, they were given a way of life that looks different than everybody else in the world. God reveals to the Israelites these great commandments. And Moses tells the Israelites God's message. He said, if you follow these commandments, I will be your God and you will be my people. And through doing this, I will, God will bless them he will give them land, milk and honey, and he will bless them and their descendants. So then uh, they go through the desert, eventually get into the Holy Land, and what happens in the next in, uh, the next story after they get to the Holy Land, the book of Judges? What happens immediately in the book of Judges? The next generation does not live the Ten Commandments. They forget about God who chose them. They choose to worship and practice the things that their neighbors are doing, the exact thing that God told them not to, like, kind of like uh, fertility gods, uh, different gods where they, like, for, I don't want to even go into it, but it's definitely not good. <laughs> it's like killing your firstborn son basically for good luck, offering up to the god Molech. So, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that was going on. And uh, so, this is what God is calling them to. So, after they would, after they fell away from the commandments, fell away from God, their lives become miserable. God just said, "Okay, that's what you want to do. Have at it." And uh, they become enslaved by their neighbors a couple different times. And after forty years, they say, "Oh yeah, God made this promise." So they ask God for help, and God sends a judge to help them. Thus, the Book of Judges. So an example of a judge is Samson. Samson and Philistines. The Philistines were oppressing 
Jewish people God allowed that to happen because they weren't following the Ten Commandments. So then keep moving on. Eventually you have King David in the year 1000. His son Solomon builds the first temple. And then a little bit later on, there's, there's prophets during the time between Moses and King David, but I want to focus a little bit more on the prophets uh, around the year 700 to 587. So the prophets, they do a couple things. One is they call the Israelites back to following God the Father. They tell them to repent, turn away from sin, turn towards God, follow the commandments. And they have difficulty in doing that. And then uh, the prophets also prophesy about the Messiah, the, the chosen one who has come to save his people, the one who's going to bless the world. They even talk about the, work, the blessing that the world will receive through the Messiah. So then uh, the prophets, uh, they specifically talk about the birth of Jesus, that he's going to be born of a virgin. He's going to perform miracles, heal the sick, uh, talks about giving sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, help the lame walk, people with legs ain't working, and casting out demons. So they predict exactly what Jesus is going to do as far as the uh, miracles go. They also talk about how he's going to bring people together, and then they also prophesy exactly how he's going to die. I'll give you a bunch of proof text on slides. They space, like one section of Isaiah basically says everything that Jesus went through. Same with a particular book and and uh, part of part of the book of wisdom. They talk about the religious leaders turning against Christ as they wound up doing. So I think that talking about the prophets, it's important to, to talk about them because of the continuity of God's relationship with his chosen people, the covenant that God made with Moses, the Ten Commandments, and then uh, we get down to Jesus, and St. Paul talks about Jesus being the new Adam. Why is that? Because he does the exact opposite of the first Adam. The first Adam was disobedient to God, and same with Eve. The opposite. Mary, blessed Virgin Mary, is called the new Eve. She was also obedient to God where Eve wasn't. When they ate from the tree of knowledge of good of evil, good and evil, introduced death into the world, introduced sin into the world. We're all born with that. That's called uh, original sin from the original sin. So, blessed Virgin Mary is born free from original sin. That is the definition of the Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception isn't Jesus being born, it's the Blessed Virgin of Mary being born free from original sin. Because Jesus wanted it. Jesus uh, was born of the Virgin Mary through the Holy Spirit, and he received his flesh from the Blessed Virgin Mary. He was born pure, undefiled, and free from original sin. So where she fits in as the new Eve, when Gabriel visited the Blessed Virgin Mary and said, you will conceive of the Holy Spirit and you will have a son who will save the world from their sins and then you will name him Jesus. Jesus, the name means God saves. And she said, behold, I am the handmaid of the Lord. That's the yes that Mary gave to God in her life and saying yes to the plan of God's salvation to the world. Then uh, with Jesus being the new Adam, he said, I came to do my Father's will. I came to only say the words that my Father came, has me, or wants me to say. Jesus reveals God the Father to us in God's love, and God the Father reveals Jesus to us and his mission of love for us to draw us back to the Father. So the purpose of Jesus dying on the cross is twofold. It's to destroy sin, to free people from sin, and then also destroy death, the two main consequences of the fall of Adam and Eve. So I'd argue if you look at the world in the context of original sin, everybody being born of original sin, 
everybody. Uh, so what original sin did was it destroyed the relationship Adam and Eve had with God. It caused division within them because prior to that, human beings were not created to sin. We were just created to live a virtuous life, to live close to God. They didn't have any temptation of sin. There's no inner battle between good and bad. They just lived a virtuous life naturally because that's the way God created them. So then with original sin, that introduces that spiritual battle within people, the difficulty in doing right, and uh, making doing the wrong thing seem easy. And so it takes effort and God's grace to conquer sin in our lives. So that's what Jesus wanted to heal, that division that we have within us, and then also unite us closer to the Father through giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is the love between God the Father and God the Son. The Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Trinity. We receive God's love, the Holy Spirit, our baptism to help guide us and help free us from sin. Original sin is washed away and we are united to God. We're given union with God that was lost in the garden and it was lost all the way until Jesus gave us the sacrament of baptism. So Jesus told the apostles, go teach the nations the commandments and baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that's what exactly the apostles did and that's what we've continued to do since uh, Jesus died. So I would say without the doctrine of original sin, it's hard to make sense of the world. Like the good, the bad things that happen, the decisions that we see people make. If we don't have original sin, I would say it really doesn't make much sense. So Jesus' whole purpose was to heal us of that, unite us to the Father. And so really our job as a church, my job as a priest, is to do what St. Paul told us to do, which is reconcile people to God, to bring people to God and help heal any division that people feel between themselves and God. Because that can happen at different times. It's not easy. Life isn't easy. Different things happen. And it's easy to you know, question things and get disappointed with God, get angry with God. And I'm on for helping people come closer to God and also realize the great love that God has for us. So does that mean, does that stuff make sense that I mentioned? I kind of talk slightly fast. I mean, does that make sense to you guys at all? Just being the mission of Christ and then the continuance of that? Because uh, I would say that's pretty much a very important thing to uh, remember. So if I go back to this one. So that's essentially Jesus' summary of the Ten Commandments. I like that because it's easy to remember, it's easy to teach kids, and uh, we know someone is doing that when we see it. It's pretty easy to uh, recognize. Um, let me just see. Instead of having a whole packet, I just did this, because I, you know, a couple uh, things here. Oh yeah, so getting back to Jesus's uh, miracles. So what Jesus did is when we read about him in scriptures in the four gospels, he did a lot of teaching. So you think about him going from city to city after he performed some of his first miracles, Capernaum healing Peter's mother-in-law, and then he heals everybody in town who came to him. He leaves town, goes off by himself and prays, and the apostles come out and meet him, and they tell him, people are looking for you, we should go back to town. And he said, no, I'm gonna go teach in the various towns. And so when I think about it sometimes, it's not written like this in the scripture, but the, if you're teaching that from town to town, Jesus would probably vary his message a little bit based on his audience and based on what he sees going on. But the apostles would have heard Jesus teach a similar message in different ways many times. So that would have been just like implanted in their brain from hearing him speak so often to so many different people, multiple times a day to different people. And then they see the miracles that Jesus did 
and those miracles help people to believe in what he's teaching, that he's the son of God, and he came to bring people to God the Father, and he came to heal people. Those outward healings that he did in scripture, they can still happen now through prayer. And I think they're almost symbolic also of the inward healing that Jesus can give us within our soul that we all need at different times in our life. And so if we, let's say we make a mistake since our baptism, in particular sin, and it's bugging us. One thing we can do is uh, go to the sacrament of reconciliation or confession. So reconciliation, what does it do? It reconciles us to God. Sin separates us from God. So one little quick story. When I was in like second grade, I did my first confession. And then that particular CCD program, they didn't have confession every year for the kids. So then went through college, I was living, I wound up living in Kenosha, went to college at UW Lacrosse, went to Kenosha, because I tried to pay for college, because it was like $3,000 a semester, so I just worked a lot, but if I do, and then I had like five bucks when I finished college, and uh, my old man's like, I'll help you the first month around my buddy from hometown, his older brother in Kenosha, two bedroom, lived in a bad neighborhood, right on the train tracks, wound up being able to pay it. And uh, so I was going to church down there. Back then, I guess I must have read the church bulletin, which I don't do now. I used to before I was a priest. And uh, I just wound up going to confession. I was like, ah, it seems like I should go to that. And I didn't really know what I was, I didn't even, I, I didn't even really know how to go to confession because I went once in second grade. I had no idea what the heck to even do in confession. I just walked in there, the priest is there, and uh, just tried to make a confession. Like, no real, like, nothing really happened, like, inside for me. Like, sometimes people feel a real sense of relief and forgiveness. Sometimes you don't. You just don't know what's going to happen spiritually. It's up to God, not us. We can just put ourselves in the place for that. So I just, uh, you know, it's... You know, sometimes people go to confession, it's been a long time. So that's an example where it was a while. Like my particular spiritual life, I just did things that like made sense. Like one time I just started going to church like daily mass because it was like at 6.15 at night after work. I don't know why, I was living in a different town and they had like a few different priests and one priest was like a Spanish guy, spoke Spanish and he never had a homily at the mass, so it's like a shorter mass. I was just, I never even thought about it. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I guess uh, I'll just go home now. Um, I remember at one point I thought, ah, I read the bulletin or something, yeah, I pray the rosary. So I started praying the rosary a little bit. I wasn't really familiar. I didn't even know the Hail Mary, because like CCD was different when I was a kid than it is now. And uh, so just trying to like, do some different spiritual things that came across my uh, radar. I read scripture a little bit. Uh, I remember at one point when I was working, I just took a, a job that wasn't good out of college, let's say. It's sales job, straight commission. After six months, I was like making some deals, whatever. So that's why I used to think uh, this would be controversial. Before Trump was president and while he was president, he, used, he always talked about deals. It's like, we need politicians that make deals. But uh, I only thought that was funny because my boss used to say, Greg, we need some deals here. <laughs> we need closers. And uh, so I'm working this job and it's fine, you know. And uh, so I remember, but it just didn't feel like it was like, the, it just didn't feel like something I wanted to do long term and I had no idea what to do I never really had a real clear direction in my life I just felt like well I liked accounting in high school I'll do that in college whatever uh, so I remember one night I got home from work and I got down on my knees the only time I really ever that was the only time first time I ever said that in my life in a prayer I'm like God what do you want me to do with my life <laughs> Kind of the prayer of desperation. And uh, I can't tell you why, but I just heard priesthood. And my first response was no. And uh, I did not do that for a 
good one. That might have been like 23, and I went to the seminary at like 27. So, I mean, uh, just kind of an example of just like spiritual life in someone's life. Like, I think the thing I think is unique about people is since God created each of us, He created us for one reason, that is to love us. He knows us each personally and individually. Just like a parent would say, you know, they love all their kids, they don't treat them all the same. God loves all of us, and he treats us in a certain way that's particular to each of us because he knows each of us inside and out. Jesus said he knows how many hairs are on uh, top of our head, which is fairly interesting. And he goes on to say, you know, I take care of the birds of the sky. How much more am I going to take care of you? So don't worry about uh, what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat. He's going to take care of us. So I think uh, just I think that sacrament of uh, reconciliation can be really powerful and uh, it's definitely a good experience. It, uh, so that so with the kids in CCD, to have them not have the experience that I had, I just have them go once a year. You know, they may or may not have a good experience. The whole purpose of it is just to have them realize, okay, I probably, it's, it's kind of a help sharpen the conscience a little bit, so give an exam and a conscience to read, and then based on the Ten Commandments, but it's particular to each age group, they read through that and think, well, maybe, or deep down we know we did wrong anyway, so some of them just go with that. So they just say, okay, I hit my brother if they're in second grade or something, you know, so just kind of realizing, okay, it isn't the right thing to do, reaffirm that. And then also realize that God forgives us for our sins. So to give them experience of that from second grade to tenth grade, hopefully, you know, maybe later in life they'll remember that, and hopefully they've had a decent experience. Saint or, uh, Pope Francis said, you know, be kind in the confessional <laughs> if you're a priest. I mean, that's obvious because it's just a sacrament of God's mercy, just trying to be a conduit of God's mercy, which is God's. Love and there's different examples in Scripture where Jesus uh, forgives people, which is pretty uh, neat to see as well. Um, so that's a little bit on that. And since I have a little bit of extra time, I'm going to go into uh, I want to go into one example of a young person. I was going to talk about this with uh, the older kids today, sixth to tenth grade just because it's an interesting uh, story. Because it's, in addition to, you know, the different youth trips, they see young people that are helping out the camps that are closer to their age and practice our faith. And, uh, you know, want to help people grow in their faith. That's why they work in these camps. So this kid was born in uh, 1991, and he died in uh, 2006, and he grew up in Milan. His name was Carlo Acutis, and recently, not long ago, he was elevated in the process of becoming a saint. One of the, the second to the last step is becoming a blessed, and then you're a canonized saint. In order to be a blessed, they've already had a biography written about him. Everything he's ever done is in there. Any works that he's done is included, it's reviewed and he's elevated once, but then once you get to Blossom, that means you have to have one scientifically, medically approved miracle through uh, a person asking him to pray for, for a particular situation. So a young kid had an incurable pancreas problem. So that's one of the things for a miracle, it has to be incurable and most likely in a kind of cause of death. So their parents asked Carlo Acutis to pray for their child that he, he is healed of that pancreatic condition that's going to kill him that's not uh, curable, not treatable. So the kid is cured through that prayer, and then it's, it's studied by scientists and doctors, and they all, in the approval process, they all have to say there's no scientific reason why this happened. And so that's 
how it became a plaza. They had a huge mass with a ton of people there, thousands. But look, just a little bit about his life. He was like a, he was pretty much a normal kid, but he's one of them kids. Sometimes you see this happen with kids. Uh, he was just given the gift of faith at a young at a young age. Some people, you know, like myself, my parents brought me to church. I didn't really kind of like get it until I was like maybe 21, 22. And as far as you know, kind of growth and faith goes. So this kid, some people get it early, lose it, get it again. This kid just had it early. And so he had that gift of faith. So he uh, liked the normal stuff kids like, Pokemon, whatever, PlayStation, and playing soccer and stuff. But he had a strong devotion to Jesus and the Eucharist at a very young age. And he asked his mom a ton of questions about our faith. And they weren't practicing Catholics. They weren't going to church at the time. And she actually wound up growing in her faith because of him asking him questions all the time. She wound up getting a theology degree on uh, Catholicism. And then he received his first communion at seven years old. And from that point on, living in Milan, those, some of those Italian towns, they got like a church. You throw a rock in any direction, you get hit a church anywhere you stand. So he, he, he just wanted to go to church every day. So that's what he did. And then he, because of his love for the Eucharist, he wanted to help people grow in their love for the Eucharist. He'd see people staying out in long lines for concerts, but not putting the time in for Jesus. So he uh, got, when he was eight years old, he got a hold of, of a college level book on how to code for computers. And he taught himself how to do that. And then he started with his friends, he'd make dumb videos, put voiceovers and stuff, fun stuff. But on his own, him and his parents visited these different shrines where Eucharistic miracles happen. And he wanted to document all of these Eucharistic miracles. He documented 150 of them. He didn't go to every spot. And he developed a website. And then on the website, you can read about uh, each miracle. He, act he also enjoyed visiting the different shrines in Europe where the Blessed Virgin Mary appeared and they built a shrine in honor of her appearance to someone. So they have like the famous ones in Europe like Fatima and Lourdes. Fatima is well documented by the press because they were there at Mary's last visitation when the sun rose. And uh, so it's interesting that you have on that one a perspective from the secular media and then a perspective from the religious as well. And so I'm going to just show his uh, website real quick. I think it's neat to be able to show kids this is a saint. And the last thing he's going to be a saint soon. And then uh, this is what he did. Uh, never find. There we go. So then this is what he built. There's some videos, some different things. But I'm going to go down. I'll just look. These are the ones he categorized it categorizes the miracles by country. And then I just went down to this uh, Venezuela one because it was fairly recent. So that's kind of like what he, this is just one page. Some of them are a little bit longer than uh, others. So he, uh, in addition to doing this work, he wanted to help poor people because he was just driven by that desire to uh, when Jesus said, if you do this, you're doing it. If you help someone who's poor, you're doing it for me. He wanted to serve Jesus and the poor. So he'd give the poor what he could, so he'd beg, something like that. And then uh, at the age of 15, he was diagnosed with an acute form of leukemia, and he died within a few days of that diagnosis. And uh, so it, in addition to his faith, he just had a strong desire and that strong desire to receive Jesus in the Holy Communion, he also had a strong desire to unite with him in uh, heaven. So he's actually okay with that. And then, uh, so that's 2006 when he uh, passed away. So just a little bit on this particular miracle. This is a priest who in, uh, well, it says the Mass of December 8th, 1991. That's actually the uh, Feast of Immaculate Conception. He broke it the Eucharist, and then it says it was, he consumed one of the pieces, and he divided into four parts, 
returned it to the patent, and then later on he looked towards the patent, and he saw one of the pieces of the hose he decided he uh, broke, showed a red spot, and it continued to flow out a little bit, and then after mass, he put it in a safe spot, six in the morning, he went and looked at it, and some blood continued to flow that later began to dry, and then they put it in this thing. People can go visit it uh, for Eucharistic adoration, 24 hours a day, seven days a week at a particular religious sister's uh, convent chapel. And it said the strange thing, the blood flowed from only one side, and the particle nevertheless was without stating the remainder of the Eucharist. And then the fun part is, with these miracles, they'll test the blood type. The blood did not match the blood type of the priest. It says it was AB positive, and then it says that's the same blood type that was found on the, blood, on the Shroud of Turin. The Shroud of Turin is what covered Jesus when he was put into his tomb. So I'll show a picture of that in a second. Um, so it said it also matched uh, another, oh yeah, another host of the Eucharist miracle of Lanciano occurring in 750 BC. It says it was, that one was analyzed by 500 commissions of the World Health Organization. So the blood from that Eucharistic miracle matched the blood from one in 750 BC. There's one other one, I think it was in Brazil, it's further up on this thing. It, the, they actually identified by the blood which organ that blood comes from in the human body. And actually that one, it came from the heart. So this is just, I don't get into a whole lot of uh, miracles. Some people find it helpful to their prayer, prayer life. Some are uh, indifferent. But these 150 Eucharistic miracles, some of them in the past, like in Italy, would happen when people are questioning the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. And then all, all of a sudden, there's a Eucharistic miracle that happens that helps confirm people and their faith. So like for a miracle to happen, you know, it's got to be beyond um, an explanation. So the, so when they said that the blood is from the Shroud of Turin, that's the uh, Shroud of Turin right there. So the left side would be the actual cloth, and then this side would be just an impression of it, what its face would look like based on that cloth. So there's been tons of studies in the Shroud of Turin and the documentaries and it's fairly uh, interesting to look into. And, you know, I've, I've, watched the, I've watched one good documentary, but I can't tell you a thing from it. <laughs> Love to tell you a bit more about that, but I'll have to end it with that. So I think that's good enough for today. So anyway, uh, good to see everybody today. Thanks for all your help. And uh, we'll just go and meet inside of the church.